to let me invite to the stage Jessica Kerr. Jess is known for her keynotes, blog, and tweets. And actually, today you're also going to know her for her mohawk. She, pro she, she podcasts on, great, on Greater Than Code and Arrested DevOps. Currently, she spends much of her time building semantics. You will correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> Jess, through industrial logic. Jessica, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Ricardo. All right, all right. Uh, thank you for joining me for your Friday afternoon to talk about what used to be one of my least favorite topics, gamification. Uh, starting with the story that started to turn me around on it. In the summer of 2020, I needed to learn something about computer security in order to talk to people about secure code. And there is a lot of information on the web and it is not fun to read. It is just walls and walls of text. And I was, I was struggling with this until, until someone invited me to join their group. And the group of us worked through puzzles on TriHackMe. TriHackMe is a website that gamifies learning about computer security. It's really cool. I do recommend it. And on TriHackMe, there's a whole collection of little scenarios little capture the flag games where someone has created a Docker container and try hack me will spin one up, give you the IP and you get to hack into it. So you like look at its website, you know, like view source and find hidden directories to dig up usernames and passwords. And then you log in as that username with SSH. And then, and then you get root by like exploiting pseudo and shadowing a Python library. Spoilers, sorry. Um, but but it's really fun. There's lots of different possibilities. And as a group, we would try these. And then try Hack Me. It keeps track of your score for each game, how many flags have you captured. And then overall score in the whole site campaign of where are you in like the world rankings of try Hack Me users. Okay. And the point is to advance your skills in computer security. And, and it, it works, but it worked for me, not because of the scoreboards or the leaders or the badges, but because of the group of people I was doing it with. Because we would log into Discord on a Sunday afternoon and collaboratively work through one of these, uh, these Capture the Flag games. And of course, there were lots of pictures of Pincho, who is the cat of our leader and wears costumes. So, so this was a win. Um, and it was a great example of, a, of gamification used well. In general, gamification usually includes scores, leaderboards, achievements, uh, ways to make whatever it is you're trying to accomplish more fun. So Fitbit gamifies exercise, or at least walking, um, and, and soon instead of being bored walking around, you're like, oh, have I got my steps today? And then you learn how to shake your wrist just right to make your numbers go up. And anyway, it kind of defeats the purpose. But uh, but um, businesses gamify being a customer. Frequent flyer miles have this little meter that that, in, that uh, convinces me to fly United to Detroit through Chicago instead of direct on Delta because, oh, I just need to see that meter go up and maybe I can get the next status level, which doesn't really accomplish anything. But it's gamified. Uh, so gamification, th this is what we think of it as. And, and at least it can make some things more fun. Try Hack Me certainly works. So do we want to use it at work? If we gamify work, then we're setting little incentives for very specific things. Um, they can definitely be twisted as, as in Dilbert. They're very excited about uh, finding bugs that they create. Uh, at an extreme, what if, what if our goal is to uh, deliver features? And so we quantify the features in JIRA tickets, and then we say, whoever has the most JIRA tickets will be in the lead on the scoreboard. We'll put it up on the team wall. Yeah, this would be an extreme. Um, giving that score, as my, my teenager put it, uh, invalidates some people and overvalidates others. For instance, a lot of the work that we do 
is uh, is glue work, is coordinating with other teams, is reading code, is finding out what's going on, is going back and 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 tweaking things so that they're readable. I'm guessing that on this team, Mary is doing a lot of that glue work that makes our work actually useful um, and happen. And Chris is pretty more focused on closing those tickets. And Chris's work here is over-validated because, I mean, is he leaving the code in a better state than he found it? Nothing here measures that. Score narrows our focus to one thing at the cost of everything else. And there are a lot of emergent properties in our system, such as can we come back and change it later safely, uh, that, that are lost in this narrow focus. And even worse, as soon as you make it a competition, we're not a team anymore. If you stack rank uh, your employees, you can't have a proper team because competition undermines collaboration. When Mary has a question about the code Chris wrote yesterday, Chris has no incentive to stop moving forward on tickets in order to help Mary understand his haphazard variable names. Competition eats collaboration. And, and what's more, it, it isn't fun. I mean, I, I observed that some people, especially Americans, enjoy this, but I don't. You know what's fun? Learning together is fun. Having meaningful interactions with the people on my team is fun. And building something together that actually makes a difference for the people who use our software, that's fun. And it's, it's a deeper kind of fun. It's actually meaningful. Competition saps the meaning. It replaces intrinsic motivation with extrinsic motivation. And it's intrinsic motivation that helps us do our best work, not some scoreboard on the wall. So when, when I refer to gamification as garbage, I mean scoreboards and leaderboards, achievements, whatever, I don't care. But these elements that pit us against each other and give us a narrow focus on just one aspect, these actually demolish our future selves. They demolish our team relationships and they are corrosive. And yet, and yet, there's got to be something else here. Because we don't aim for our best score in our teams. We don't really. Of course, we don't actually put Jira leaderboards up, I hope. Um, but, but even so, we talk about uh, a laser focus on business value. Okay, estimated business value. And we're going, to, we're going to achieve that estimated business value with feature deliveries, right? So even if we talk about, we are very focused on delivery, we don't take the most direct path. We don't log into production and change the code or alter table on our database. No, no. We, we require code review and we stop to write automated tests and make sure they pass. We, we have meetings. We don't code all day. We're, we're talking to each other. We're gathering the knowledge and understanding we need in order to implement something useful. And we have tools for this. We have source control. We have, um, we, we pair maybe. We use a linter. Um, and we have the platform and whatever observability tools we have to, to know what's going on. We have a lot of abilities some of these, you can argue which of these abilities and which of these are actually obstacles we set for ourselves, but we do this. We have a process. And so we want to, to achieve as much feature delivery as we can subject to a process that is designed to preserve emergent properties like the reliability of the software, like our ability to change it later, like security. And of course, this looks like a game to me. For instance, in American football, we want to get the ball through the goalposts or into the end zone, but we don't take the most efficient means possible. We don't grab a bag of footballs and drag them into the end zone and say, hooray, and have a hot dog. No, no, we move one ball while the clock is running within bounds um, in opposition to the other team, but, but we don't hit them too hard. There's all kinds of rules that we set for ourselves or that we have set in the 140 page rule book that is American football. 
Oh, maybe it's 160 now. Anyway, we have some abilities that we can use to get the goal to the end zone. We can run, we can pass forward. Occasionally we can even kick. Why do we call it football? Um, and then there's, there's abilities that have evolved in the community. Plays like the quarterback sneak or the sweep. So clearly there is a resemblance here between what we do and games. But, but the score, whoops, here we go. This, the score is not uh, the resemblance. That is not what I want to take out of this, this, um, this analogy, right? Because because the score and the leaderboards and the competition, these are superficial characteristics of games. Yes, games have these, but you take, but if you just take them and slap them onto something that isn't a game, it doesn't work. It doesn't make it fun in general. I mean, there are cases like Try Hack Me where they've really made it work. Um, but if, if you want the results someone has achieved in one situation and you want to achieve them in your situation, the trick is not to take what they do superficially. The trick is to copy their questions, not their answers. What did they ask? What process did they use to achieve this success, to find what worked for their situation? Can we do that in games, with games, comparing them to our work? Well, let's, let's think about why games are fun. It's not for winning, okay? If, if winning were the fun part of games, I would just play tic-tac-toe against the computer and I would always go first. No, no, we prefer to play games against other players who are near our skill level, games that challenge us, because it's about the experience. We don't play games to win, although sometimes that's fun. We play games for the playing for the experience of striving play. And we, in a game, we strive for a goal that we don't actually care about. I, I don't really care um, if my characters in Genshin are leveling up or I defeat these monsters. That might be fun, but it's not the point. I don't care about getting a, the ball in a little hole in golf, although that's, that's actually kind of satisfying, but that's not the point. <laughs> I don't care about gaining victory points in my board game. But you can tell because at the end of the game, I put them back in the box. I don't hoard them forever. They're not my life's purpose. I care about the experience of playing. So I choose, I choose within the scope of the game to care deeply about getting that ball into the end zone, to care deeply about those victory points in order to have the experience of play. And it's the game designer's job to craft that experience. The thoughts in this talk are inspired by this book, Games, Agency is Art, by C.T. Wynn. Um, C.T. Wynn is a philosopher, philosophy professor, and also a writer of incredibly clear, compelling arguments. Highly recommend all of his work, including this book. This book is easy to read and fun. Uh, but in games, agency is art. Dr. Wynn shows that games are about designing agency. By agency here, I mean a mode of action. The game designer crafts an agency for the player. The player choose to adopt that agency in order to have the experience of play. And the agency consists of uh, goals, rules and abilities. And the interplay of these three creates the, that experience. Some elements of the experience that the book goes over include the feeling of flow, sociality, and becoming or learning. Who do we become out of this game? How can we get this kind of experience, the kind of experience that a game designer aims for, but in our teams? Let's start with flow. Uh, flow is that, that feeling of like focus where you're super intent on the task and time goes really fast. In Super Mario Brothers, we're given the abilities to jump and run and the goals of a world full of chasms to jump over, 
and monsters to jump upon. This is really satisfying. And, and then at the end of the level, you go for that flag and the flag is just high enough that if you hit it just right, you can barely get it at the top. Our goals and abilities are perfectly aligned. And that's so satisfying. And then, you know, as you, as you get better and jumping and running become easy, the levels get harder, the platforms start to move. And then we have to, when oh, you get fire flowers and stuff. So you gain more abilities and harder goals. That's how it works with games. How can we achieve this alignment of goals and abilities in our team? Well, it depends what our goal are, goals are. If our goal is to deliver features, then we need abilities like proficiency in our programming language and the frameworks we use, the systems we interface with in our libraries, and we need enough understanding of what we're going to implement. And then we can probably achieve that goal. We can get that feeling of flow uh, that was like really satisfying in my early programming career. As our teams mature, uh, we can move on to the, the more significant goal of providing valued capabilities to support software, running software in production that is actively creating a new capability for either customers or some or other software in the business or people inside the business, someone has an additional capability in the world because our software is running in production. If that's our goal, we need more abilities. We need some understanding of our infrastructure and we need to be on call. And we need to know how our code gets from uh, commit to running in production. And we need to be able to increment and improve that. Uh, we need observability into what's going on in production. It takes a lot more abilities and a lot more knowledge. And can we, as a company, as an organization, or as a leader, um, also as the people on the team, can we give ourselves these abilities so that we can achieve a harder goal without overloading ourselves with cognitive load? And it does take a team. You cannot achieve this goal with just one person. My CTO, Mipsy Tipsy, points out that individual engineers can write software. We can program. But it takes a team to deliver, ship, and maintain software. Providing capabilities of running software in production that is improving, that is secure, that is consistently um, up and only getting faster, this takes a team. That is the smallest unit of delivery. So when we want to provide value capabilities, we need all of these abilities within a team. And if these abilities are not all in one team, if they're scattered throughout the organization in operations, in product, in infrastructure, then I would argue you don't have four teams here. You have one team that's very poorly organized and has a low collaboration <laughs> compared to a bunch of people, uh, compared to, to six people with all of these abilities that we normally call a team. Uh, but the goal, of, the goal of any business is in fact to provide valued capabilities, both internally and externally. And we need all of these abilities in order to do that. And when you think about that, when you think about designing agency, um, if you want to design agency for a particular team, give them the abilities that they need to achieve their goals. Only then can we have an experience of flow and a satisfying work day. Um, also within the team, how our goals and rules interact determines our experience with each other and who we become together. Example, my husband plays League of Legends. League of Legends, uh, you, you get two players of five players, human players each, and you put them against each other. So it's a five on five PVP. And you can either get matched up with random people from the internet, or you can form a consistent team of real humans that, that you play with regularly. Uh, my husband reports that if you do that, if you form a consistent team of five, you better be friends with those people now and good friends, because playing the game together is not going to make you friends. In general, in League of Legends, there's a big map, and, and uh, one player is always like, oh, why weren't you over here helping me? Because they can't see the six other things that you were trying to do on the other side of the map. The, the, um, the limited information there makes for negative social interactions. Whereas my kids and I play Genshin Impact, 
And in Genshin, you can get three, you can get together with three random people on the internet to kill some monsters. And there's no PvP. It's just if there's more of you, you can kill the monsters faster. And and my kids are like, oh, I love, I love the the chat on Genshin. People are so nice. <laughs> it's a completely different interaction facilitated by the rules of the game. And the goals of the game. Is it to beat the others or to beat the monsters together? Uh, so how do we do that on our team? We can look at the way our processes affect our relationships. My least favorite example is blocking code review because I just want to fix the bug. I have a fix in for the bug and someone else is supposed to review it. And their job is to preserve all the emergent properties of the system. Is it reliable? Is it tested? Is it secure? Everything else besides getting that bug into production, that's their job to watch out for. So we're in opposition. Blocking pull reviews create antagonism when there was none. Really, the purple and the green developer both want to deliver features, but they're placed in opposition um, in the blocking code review. If the code review is not blocking, then, this, they're, then they're not in opposition anymore and they can still work together. If they're pairing, then they're not in opposition at all. And, and when the purple person is like, oh, well, have you considered writing a test for this? Um, and actually I did consider it, but I didn't know how. And also the tests for this function are in the old framework that I'm not supposed to add more tests into. But if we were pairing, then we sit down and we do it together. Oh, let me show you how to convert that test. Big difference, big difference than from asynchronous blocking code review. A positive example of designing for social interaction that I see in teams is the standup, especially when the objective of the standup is to get other people unstuck. Oh, I couldn't figure this out. Oh, I know something about that. Or I know somebody who knows something about that. Relationships are also abilities when you need information. Uh, that can, that's, that's a way that we improve social interaction within the team. Even better, ensemble programming, also called mob programming, but ensemble working is the, the nicer name for it. And in ensemble working, uh, we take turns typing at the keyboard, but every decision is voiced. And we get to find out why people are making those decisions. Uh, this maximizes learning within the team and also applies everyone's knowledge at the same time to the code. Also, there's no merge conflicts when you actually work together. Um, yeah, so consider how your processes, the abilities and rules you set for the team um, and the goals, how that affects the relationships with each other. And finally, uh, the, what is the future of the team that we're creating ourselves? Do the rules let us increase our abilities over time? In games, you totally want to increase your, your abilities. In Genshin, it's all about leveling up your characters, or at least that's, that's one of the objectives, uh, to make them more powerful, to get more abilities and talents. Um, in uh, Wingspan, this is a board game, you start out with the ability to play a bird or get a food or lay two eggs or draw one bird card. Mostly you aim for playing birds because playing birds increases your abilities for later in the game. So toward the end of the game, I'm probably done playing birds because now with all these birds, I can get three food. I can lay three eggs. I can draw two bird cards, plus all the other abilities that are on my bird cards that are special. Uh, and then toward the end of the game, in the last couple rounds, I'm just going to lay eggs, lay eggs, lay eggs, because that's victory points. This kind of mechanic where you start out with a few abilities and you use those abilities to gain more abilities and then use those abilities to win is called engine building, a well-known thing in board games and game design. How can we do this in our teams? Well, I think this is where like DevOps is really important, where operating your own software uh, improves your ability to develop the software in order to make it operate more smoothly. Because when you see what triggers in production, what errors aren't handled, then you can add handling for that. You can increase automation to smooth rollbacks when those are hard. Uh, we, as developers, 
We work on computers and we work in computers and we have tremendous ability to make our own jobs easier, to increase our own abilities when our goals and rules are compatible with that. Are you supposed to just drop the code as soon as it works and move on to the next ticket? Or is it culturally expected in your team that you'll refactor that code? Refactoring is a form of engine building. This is going to help us understand and change the code safely later. So, so that applies directly. This is super important in our teams because we have more than a software system. We have a socio-technical system, including the people and the software. And it's more than just a mechanical system. It is a somathesy. A somathesy is a learning system made of learning parts. Of course, we learn. We learn from each other. And the running software learns from us as we change it. And we learn from it, especially if we have observability, but also from automated tests, from uh, what it says in the logs, from exceptions that it throws. This whole system of code and coders forms a somathesy. And you grow a somathesy by increasing those flows of learning. That grows our abilities to do more things later. But how do you do that? I mean, I mean, look at this. This is a mess. <laughs> How do we get better at this mess? In our work, there's an infinite number of things that we could do on any given day. How do we choose between them? Oh, we desperately would love some value clarity. This is where games succeed. This is one of the ways that games are like really relaxing and, and fun to play because in the real world, Every action we take has implications uh, on many levels of systems for us, for our team, for the future of the software, for uh, all different timescales and um, breadths. Um, and it's really hard to know what's good. In games, there's a very clear definition of good. It's the score. Does this get me points? Okay, then it's morally right for me to do this because I'm supposed to try to win because that makes the game fun. Value clarity is really appealing because it helps us move forward. And we need some of it in our real work. We need to know what we're aiming for and whether, whether a particular thing is going to take us in that direction. If you make the measurement super clear, though, and use the same one for your whole life, you wind up with value capture. When that, that score, that step counter that, that you generated as a heuristic for am I getting enough exercise becomes what we value. And we start just shaking our wrist and we choose to, to do more walking instead of swimming when swimming would be better for us because we've decided that our step counter is the definition of health. No, it isn't. In our work, when we've decided, not, not decided, actually the problem is that we don't decide when we have absorbed that promotion equals value as a person, then that stack ranking becomes our measure of good. And therefore the, the qualifications for promotion become the definition of success. And the, the number of JIRA tickets starts to really matter to our self-esteem. <laughs> That's not healthy, okay? There's a lot of accidental gamification that happens. As soon as you slap a number on something, that's a score. That is subject to value capture, um, and that's dangerous. But we have to do this, right? We do this all the time, everywhere. Uh, objectives and key results is the current one at Honeycomb. You might have KPIs, key performance indicators, or something we love to measure team performance so we can evaluate our teams legibly. And inevitably, because the key results are measurable with numbers and the objective is just words, they start to outweigh the objective. For instance, a few quarters ago at Honeycomb, we have the objective of getting more users, which is great. Uh, but then we set the key results for the events team at get more signups. And meanwhile, the sales to sales development reps are supposed to contact everyone within an hour. So the events team is like more signups. And they say to the people at conferences, hey, if you want a t-shirt, sign up for our product. And then the, the, the sales staff people are 
are working really hard to email those people within an hour to see if they need any help getting data into Honeycomb. And no, they don't. They just wanted a t-shirt. This is not achieving our wider objective of people getting value from our product. So, uh, so watch out for these. OKRs are dangerous. But if you have more than one, that helps, more than one key result. If you time box them so that it is not your value as a person that is determined by uh, how many how many tickets you've closed or what the availability of your system is right now, um, it is just what we're focusing on for the quarter. And then the real key is to care about the objective, not the numbers. That takes constant vigilance. It takes It takes the people in charge asking about the objective. Is this still the useful number? Because at their best, OKRs express alignment within teams, but at their worst, they substitute for alignment. And that's accidental gamification. But the good news is from games, when we go deeper with our gamification, that we can consciously design this agency in our teams because our teams are always working within an agency that we offer them and that they have also evolved within themselves. Um, and that agency is very different between different teams. Like, have you ever been on or seen a team that has really good alignment, they know what they're trying to accomplish, and uh, they have enabling constraints that they've chosen? Like, um, we, we keep our build time under 10 minutes, and we do really small changes that we push to production every day. A trunk-based development, that's an enabling constraint that makes other things easier. It generally makes... Uh, changes safer. It makes uh, troubleshooting easier. Um, we we always write automated tests for our functions. That slows us down in the present, but is an enabling constraint for future change so we know whether we broke anything. And the result can be increasing power. This team can support more and more valued capabilities as they go along, where the, the natural direction in software is... <laughs> is more like a struggle because um, there's other teams that I've seen and been on that are given numbers to hit as their goal featured or dates, dates by which to deliver some roadmap elements. And in their way are a bunch of boxes to check. You must fill out a budget code before we will give you a container. We, we will run your container with your new service in it. And then they wind up with not, not enclosed abilities, but they have to beg other teams for stuff, you know, fill out a form to get the permissions that you need to see what's going on in the test environment. And then after you fill out the form, find out who you need to beg to actually get that done. The results are very different. And the experience of these teams is totally different. The developers on this team are getting better and better. The developers on this team are getting more and more miserable and smaller. The good news is and game design can help us. In fact, um, I, I read the first chapter in Characteristics of Games and it was like, boom, boom, boom. Here are three important characteristics of games and they all apply directly to software teams. For instance, it was like, consider the time span of play. Uh, the game is the usual one we think about that is set by the rules. Uh, but many games have smaller atoms that are also satisfying. So in poker, you typically play, I don't know, a, a, a night. A night of poker is a game. Um, but a hand of poker is a satisfying atom. Uh, a session is however long uh, you choose to play. So like in Try Hack Me, an atom would probably be like solving one element of the puzzle, finding um, a directory served by the website that wasn't advertised in a link. Um, whereas a session was however long we sat there on a Sunday afternoon and often we'd take two sessions to play a game. And then there's the wider campaign that encompasses all our relationships. Uh, Gloomhaven has a really, doesn't have really satisfying atoms, but it does have um, both a game, one scenario where you fight some monsters and a wider campaign where you get new scenarios to play and your characters level up, that's really satisfying. In our work, we clearly have a campaign. It's like the whole product that we're supporting and a session is like a day. And there's this question of, can you fit an atom into a session? Because if not, it's really unsatisfying to go home at the end of the day and not feel like you accomplished something. So what is an atom in our work? 
it depends <laughs> on on how uh, your work is organized, on your process. I'm most satisfied if I get to deploy something. That's the best. But maybe you qualify a story as an atom and feel good if you've implemented that. I often have to be satisfied with having created a pull request because there's that blocking asynchronous code review in the way of my deployment. So I can just be satisfied with that. Uh, but I love for a commit, a single commit to go right to trunk and go right to production. That would be great. Uh, G. Paw Hill, highly recommend his work. He talks a lot about many more, much smaller steps. How small can we get an atom of work so that we can effectively save our game and come back to it at any point. This is a powerful power ability. Next talks about number of players. The key insight here is how do we move, uh, how do you get a game from a one player game to a multiplayer game? Because when I was in college, programming was a single player game, but as but the smallest unit of delivery is a team, it needs to be multiplayer. And in games, the easiest thing to do is have many people play separately at the same time. And that totally works if your games are completely independent of each other, but our work is not like that. Uh, in game design, you go further and you change the rules and the abilities, and then you can get multiplayer. Ensemble work is designed as multiplayer. The person typing is not allowed to make decisions. They're only implementing decisions made by the group as a whole. And that makes it a multiplayer game and it's great. Um, then there are heuristics. Positional, uh, you need these in order to enjoy a game. These are like how you know what is better. Positional heuristics, score is a positional heuristic. It defines better and can tell you whether a particular move puts you in a better position, at least for the moment. Um, but that's only one positional heuristic. And we need lots of these code coverage. Code coverage is a number, but it's only one clue as to whether this was a good code change. Sometimes it goes down and that's a win. If you deleted uh, a test that was um, not really testing anything. Uh, these are interesting to think about. You want a lot of them. Um, and they're tricky in code, but even harder in a programming team is directional heuristics, what to do next. Experts have these and they're really hard to transfer. Pairing helps with that. Um, okay, so lots of stuff in game design and that's great. But the most important lesson to take away uh, gets back to the art part. Games are an art form of player experience crafted in agency. In our code, we work in agency, uh, both the agency of the people who use our software and in ourselves. Now, I don't think this is art. In a previous talk, I talked about how art wasn't always recognized as a thing. I think software development is in that situation now. It is a brand new thing that we don't have a definition for yet. I think game design is just another clue in addition to we take some things from math and from engineering. But the closest I have in words is that ongoing software development is the practice of somathesy. It is working within participating in a learning system made of learning parts to increase the flows of learning and the capabilities we can provide to the world. And game design is a great source of insight because it's a whole field with research and textbooks and it doesn't suck to read about. It's not boring. This is Pincho giving you permission to read about game design and play games and notice how the different rules and abilities affect your social interaction because we can use that in our teams. And the biggest thing to notice is that as in games, at work, we choose which agencies to adopt. Agencies that are offered to us or agencies that we craft for ourselves. Um, just as in a game, uh, we choose a goal and it's not our big life goal. It's just one layer. We have a goal for the turn. We have a goal for the game that's assigned. And then we have our wider goals. <coughs> and we have that at work too. Um, we have that at work too. And at any level, like in a game, we can stop playing. If you don't feel that you can stop playing, 
if you can not um, adopt this particular goal, not choose this ticket, not keep this job, that's a different problem and it's dangerous. But fortunately, there's a lot of jobs for software developments, and software developers, and we can stop playing. Just, you don't have to quit your job if you don't like it. Recognize that you're not trapped. Recognize that you choose the goals to adopt and whether to adopt them in your whole life or only during working hours. We can do that. We don't have to have the same goals, the same passions 24 seven. We can choose to be passionate about, uh, about clean code only while refactoring and not while reading the code and getting mad at it. Adopt agencies when they're useful to you. Promotions are not the only way to career satisfaction. Okay, so we choose our agencies, do it well. We design our agencies. And like Valheim, one of my favorite video games, our teams are always in beta. And listening to feedback is what's going to help us make them better. Um, better than competition is learning together. It's both fun and meaningful. The end. I don't want to take any more of your Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, this was amazing, actually. I, I haven't thought about it. when we started, uh, when I first talked to you, I told you that the gamification is one of my favorite topics. I am amazed how naive I was with gamification. Oh, I have right, a right. When we think learn. it's just scores, yeah. Yes, we usually think it's scoreboards and you know, and leaderboards and who is the first. And it's a friendly competition. But wow, I have to, I have to admit this. This this opened my eye, my eyes a lot. I have to learn a lot. Thank you very much for this. Um, we have one question for you. Cool. Which is, what's your favorite game and why? Oh, right now I'm super into Gloomhaven. Um, and, and that's, it's because it works at so many levels, uh, because the campaign is really compelling. Um, and any given game, if we lose the fight with the monsters, my character still gains experience points and maybe gold. Uh, so mm -hmm. the campaign is always advancing. There is no real losing. Um, and then each game is compelling and, and that with the, the particular interesting strategy selection have you, ever, have you ever thought about uh classic D D and uh, what are oh yeah i love that classic uh so classic D D and its applications to the work life because when mm -hmm. i think about mm -hmm. um uh the 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 dungeon master it's not it's not mm -hmm. how, how you call but the the master yeah the dm the person, that person is is creating the whole campaign i think that's oh, the but they're of not the organization right so the beauty of, of tabletop D&D &D and similar games is that you're co-creating a world together. Yes, that the game master or dungeon master um, starts that world and creates the outline and some of the paths and picks some of the monsters, but the characters are creating too, because the characters will be like, I, I run up the wall. I'm a monk. I can run straight up walls. And I'm like, there's no ceiling. There's no ceiling in this room. I keep running. And then I've got to come up with what the heck is up there. And then the <laughs> dice is the metric, right? I mean, it would be like the measurement of how you can move on or, or how you can't move on. I mean, I think that's really, really cool to think about it in a, in a, in a real life, in a company or in a team situation. That's, um, that's a really cool uh, yeah. concept. Yeah, yeah. Jessica, thank you very and so much. With this amazing talk, we finish our pink stage in Craft Conference 2022 in Budapest. Uh, 